بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سويهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد our respected brothers sisters elders esteemed scholars السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a measure for everything, a limit for everything. Anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, a day will come that it will perish, it will finish. Anything which begins will end. Anything which starts will finish. The dunya that we stand upon today, a day will come that this dunya will come to an end. Any kingdom which ascends ultimately descends. Any dominion which rises a day will come that it will set. There's only one exception, only one kingdom, only one dominion which will never set, will never finish. And that is the kingdom and the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records this in his book. He says, Yawma hum barizun. That the day that the entirety of mankind, the first man, the last man, from the time of Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, to the final man, every single individual will be on a plane. They will all be there. Can you imagine that day? That the first man and the last man, they will all be, all be there. And Allah says, لا يخفى على الله منهم شيء. And nothing will be hidden from Allah. You will find no building, no trees, no rocks. Anywhere that you can hide, that which is in the depth of your heart will be revealed and exposed on that day. Everybody will be there. And then a time will come that death will befall every individual. And Allah will say, Ana Malik, Ana Al Jabbar, Ana Mutakabbir. And then Allah will say, Aina Malukul Ard, Aina Al Jabbarun. He said, Where are all the kings? Where are all the kings of this world? Where are all the tyrants? Where are all the you know people who thought that their kingdom and their power would last forever? That's how they live their lives. Where are the, all the dons? And then Allah will ask, For who does kingdom belong to today? And three times Allah will ask, who does kingdom belong to? And nobody will reply because everybody will not be existing at that time. And Allah will say, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَحَارِ Dominion only remains for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the measure that Allah has for this dunya and for all dunyas. And this ummah, is a measure for all other ummahs. No ummah will come after this ummah. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a measure for all the other anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. No nabi will come after the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is a measure for all. And this is why the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the first sign of the day of judgment, the first sign of the hour is my death. This is the first sign. And when all the signs finish, then you will have the final hour. The final hour was something which really intrigued the people, the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recalls this in numerous places in the Quran. يَسْعَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّعْتِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَحْ They ask you about the hour. When will the final hour occur? And Allah commands the Messenger of Allah, قُلْ 
Tell them only Allah knows. Nobody besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But when a believer asks the Prophet sallallahu when the hour will begin, listen to the answer of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The Messenger of Allah was about to begin his salah. And a man entered into the masjid. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when will the hour take place? When will the final hour take place? And the Messenger of Allah began his salah. After salah, he turned around and he said, Who asked that question? And he said, Me, O Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah said, Ma adatta laha. What have you prepared for that hour? What have you prepared? What practical steps have you taken? Don't worry yourself too much about when it will occur. You know it will occur. What have you prepared? Get your priorities right. And the man said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I don't have many salahs. I don't have many fasts. But one thing for certain is that I love Allah and His Rasul. This doesn't mean that he didn't pray his salah. He prayed his salah. He fasted, but he did not fast like the other sahaba did. And the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, I don't have many salahs, I don't have many fasts, but one thing for certain, I love you and I love Allah. And the Messenger of Allah said, Al mar'u ma man ahab. You will be on the day of judgment with that person that you loved. That's who you will be with. And Anas ibn Malik anhu says, nothing was more pleasing to the Sahaba anhum than to know that in the hereafter, after Iman, that to know that in the hereafter, they would be with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because they loved the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When it will occur, nobody knows. But Allah makes sure that it will occur. And again, He mentioned in the Quran, iqtarabat al-sa'ah. The hour is close. It's very interesting that Allah uses, for those who know Arabic, uses iqtarabat. Iqtarabat is maadi, it's past tense. Why would you use past tense for something which is gonna occur? Because the Arab would use the past tense for that thing which there was no doubt that it would occur. Certain. Certainly that it would occur. And this is why the Messenger of Allah in another narration said, I have been sent and me and the hour are like this. This is how close that we are, me and the hour. This is how close we are. So, the hour will occur. Nobody knows when it will occur. But there is something that the Messenger of Allah did mention. And that is the signs of the hour. In the famous narration, Umar ibn Khattab anhu mentions that one day we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah in the masjid. And a man enters the masjid. Very white clothes. Black hair. But none of us recognized this man. Meaning that he wasn't from Medina. Otherwise we would have recognized him. But there was no signs on his clothes that he was a traveler. It was as though that he was from Medina. But we never recognized him. And he came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And he sat next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa His knees touching the knees of the Messenger of Allah. And he said, oh Messenger of Allah. He said, tell me about Islam. Tell me about Iman. Tell me about Ihsan. And the Messenger of Allah explains these things and he confirms them. He asks a question and then he confirms it. And Umar radiallahu anhu says, I found this strange. You are asking a question and then you are confirming it. And then he said to the Messenger of Allah, Mata sah? When will the hour occur? And the Messenger of Allah said, Mal masulu anha bi'a'lama min as-sail. The one who's being asked knows no more than the one who's asking. You're asking me, you don't know, nor do I. And then he said, Akhbirni anamaratiha. Tell me about the signs of the final hour. And the Messenger of Allah said, Antalid al amatu rabbataha wa antara al hufatu al uratu al ala riya ashayat al tawaluna fil bunyan. And the Messenger of Allah mentioned some signs of the day. And then the man went away. And a little while later, the Messenger of Allah turned to Umar and he said, oh, Umar, do you know who that man was? That was Jibra'een. He came to teach you about your deen. 
There is no narration, no hadith out of all the corpus of ahadith which has so many principles or souls of deen as the hadith of Jibra'il. And in it, it has the signs of the day of judgment. Shows the importance of the signs of the day of judgment. And this is a Nabi. The word Nabi comes from the word Naba'a. Naba'a means to inform about that thing which will occur. And this is why the Messenger of Allah informed the Sahaba radiallahu anhum about what would occur. Now if you look at the signs, you could say the signs of three types. Those signs which have already occurred. So the Messenger of Allah predicted certain things and they occurred. Let me give you an example. There was a man called Suhail ibn Amr. He was one of the ardent enemies of Islam. He was very articulate. And he would dis besmirch and demonize the Muslims. One day the Muslims captured him in a battle. And Umar ibn Khattab said, Oh Amir al muminin let me knock out his teeth. Because this man is very articulate. He's always demonizing the Muslims. Let me knock out his teeth. I'll knock out all his front teeth. And then when he speaks, his tongue would waggle like this. And people would laugh at him. And the message of Allah said, no. And then he said, oh, Umar, maybe he will stand in a place one day that you will be proud of him. When the message of Allah passed away, huge portions of the Arab Peninsula rebelled. Makkah was about to rebel. And so Hail ibn Amr at that time had become a Muslim radiallahu anhu. And he stood up. And he gave a speech because he was very articulate. And nobody in Makkah rebelled. And Umar was in Medina. So they informed Umar, they said, this is what happened. And Umar stood up and he said, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are other examples, the second type of example of the signs, are those that the messenger of Allah mentions which carry on. So the Messenger of Allah said that there will be earthquakes. So we have earthquakes all the time. The Messenger of Allah said there will be false prophets. You have false prophets. And the third are those which have not occurred. Which will occur. Today I want to just speak about those which have actually occurred or occurring possibly in our time. That's what I want to speak about. If you look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an uses language which the native Arabs at that place could relate to. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He defines Jannah, Allah says, Jannatin tajri min tahti al -anhar. Gardens beneath which rivers flow. Now, if you look at Malaysia, look at UK, you have gardens, plenty of greenery, you have plenty of rivers flowing, why does Allah use this description? Jannatin tajri min tahti al -anhar. Because see, the Arabs lived in barren land, in dry, harsh weather. They had heard about gardens, they had heard about river flowing, and they dreamt about this, but they never experienced it. So when Allah defines for them, Jannatin tajri min tahti al -anhar, that in Jannah will be plenty of water, Plenty of greenery. This was something beloved to them. Even as far back as the time of Ibrahim والسلام, when he brought his wife and his child to Mecca, Allah says about the land, غير ذي زرع, total barren, no vegetation, nothing at all. But the amazing thing is that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said in a hadith, he said the hour will not be established حَتَّى تَعُودَ أَرْضُ الْعَرَبِ that the hour will not be established until the land of the Arabs returns to being green and lush and plenty of rivers. This is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. That the Arab land, Saudi and all these land, will not, the hour will not be established until it will return, be green, lush and plenty of rivers. Now how did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu know this? Today, Research has shown, Michael Petrogalia of Oxford University has mentioned, he's a professor in Oxford University in evolution and prehistory. 
He says that new innovative satellite information has shown us that the entirety of the Arab Peninsula was once green and lush. That there were tens of thousands of rivers running through it. That the first exodus of man from Africa was actually to the Arab Peninsula. Even the dry Nafud Desert, which is in Saudi, where has tens and thousands of rivers. Even the Sahara Desert was once green and lush and inhabited. But not only that, it's also strengthened by the fact that they have found remains of crocodiles, hippopotamuses, and also elephants in that area. SubhanAllah. This is amazing. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, Hatta ta'udu ardul aram anhara. But there's a second part of this narration that the hour will not be established until the earth returns to being green, lush, and plenty of rivers. Now, they say with climate change, Professor Steph Coplin of Munich University he studied that area for approximately two decades. And he says that those shrubs, which were non-literally existent once upon a time, have now grown into becoming huge shrubs. He says, I've traveled the area, I've spoken to the local Bedouins. They say within our lifetime, there were places where there was no rain. He said, the rain that we get now is uncomparable. They say, our lands, not even a scorpion could live. Not even a blade of grass could grow. He said, you have grass growing there. And this is subhanAllah. And I was reading upon this, and many of the analysts say that there's a strong possibility that that part of the world will become green and lush again. How did he know this? Because he was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is within our lifetime, you see this. Let me take, keep you in that part of the world. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, لا تقوم صح حتى تزول الجبال وانواطنها That the hour will not be established until the mountains are moved from their place. When, this, when the Messenger of Allah said this, the Arabs couldn't believe that mountains could move from their place. And they said, you sure that these mountains could move from their place? And Allah recalls in the Quran, يسألونك عن الجبال They ask you about the mountains. Which mountains were they speaking about? They weren't speaking about Everest. They had never seen Everest. Everest is 8 kilometers high. And you know how far it's entrenched into the earth? 150 kilometers in the earth. They were speaking about those small mountains around Mecca. They were saying, you're telling us that these mountains will disappear one day? They couldn't believe this. But subhanAllah, you look now. Those mountains, when the angel Jibra'il came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if you wish, I will command the, the angel which controls the mountains to turn these mountains gold for you. Do you wish this? The Messenger of Allah ﷺ declined the offer. He said, no, thank you. Where are those mountains now? They're gone. They're gone. So they can build your nice hotels, mashallah, for you and I. You know, nice big apartments for you and I. They've disappeared. Hatta tazul al But not only that, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said in a hadith which is Hassan, chain of transmission related by Abdullah ibn Umar, that the hour will not be established until the belly of Makkah is cleft open. Cleft open means where you take the inner out, where you make a hole in something. Mufti Taki Uthmani and other scholars say the Muhaddithin could never understand this narration. They actually thought it meant, they related it to the early narration I mentioned, that it will be all full of water until they carve the tunnels. And then they understood that Makkah was in the middle, now Makkah is around it, and the belly of Makkah will be cleft open and it will have river-like passages. That's what the narration meant. River-like passages. He said only w when they dug the tunnel, they realized that this is what the narration meant. 
And in the same narration, then the Prophet ﷺ said that the buildings would be higher than the mountains. Speaking about Makkah, buildings would be higher than Makkah. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, this was inconceivable. You had double story maximum. That's it. The buildings will be taller than the mountains. You look at subhanallah. Makkah now has the biggest, the tallest clock tower in the world. Nothing compares with it. Have you seen that monstrosity? You know, we call it the father of Big Ben. You know, in London we have Big Ben. This is, this is Abu Big Ben. And you look, look at it, subhanallah. And right at the end of that narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Then, The hour is close. You can actually interpret this into two meanings. The word adhallat comes from the word dhillun. It means shade and shadow. The word sa'a in the Arabic means clock, watch, the final hour. You could say adhallat sa'a actually means that the clock tower... If you take a literal meaning, that the clock tower will shade the Kaaba. Or you can have a metaphorical meaning that the hour is close. But it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't stop there. The narration that I mentioned to you at the beginning, the Prophet said the hadith of Jibreel, Antara al hufatul uratul ala riya ashay yatatawaluna fil bunyan, that you will see that they're barefooted, semi naked. Shepherds, yatatawaluna, destitute shepherds, yatatawaluna fil bunyan, that they will compete with each other in creating the tallest building. This is what the Messenger of Allah said in the Hadith of Jibra'il. The Messenger of Allah was asked, who, who are the Riyah Sh- who are the Ru'a Sha'i? Who are these shepherds? The Messenger of Allah said, Humul Arab. 1400 years ago, the Messenger of Allah said, Humul Arab. They are the Arabs. You look, where is the tallest building in the world today? Where is it? It's in Dubai. 800 meters. It doesn't finish there. See, this is where the war starts. In Kuwait, they have already the drawings for a building which is 1,001 meters. Just over a kilometer. It's called Burj Mubarak Al-Kabir. Bahrain have the Burj Al-Marjan, which is a drawing they've already made. 1,022. I, I think once upon a time, Kuala Lumpur had the tallest building, yeah? But that was before, because the Messenger of Allah said, said Humul Arab, they will be the Arabs who will compete with each other. The tallest building. They say it will be the most, the tallest building in the world, Burj Al Marjan. It will have the best indoor store, indoor market and the mall in the world. But it doesn't finish there. Then you have our man, the prince. I think his name is Prince Walid bin Talal or Talal bin Walid. The Saudi prince. He's speaking about making a building which is 1,006 meters tall, which is twice as tall as the tallest existing building in the world. This is what? Within our lifetime. Within our lifetime. But it doesn't just finish here. It, it hits the sphere of religion. The Messenger of Allah said, the hour will not be established until people will vie with each other, compete with each other in creating the largest masjid. Now I don't know the situation in Malaysia, but if you want to see a reality of this, you come to the UK, you come to the Europe. Every city is competing with each other in creating the largest masjid. If their masjid is 50 meters high, ours must be 75 meters high. If their minaret is 75 meters high, ours must be 100 meters high. And we must have the largest masjid. This is a sign of the day of judgment. Because you're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even your masjid become a sign of your pride. Even your masjid become a sign of your haughtiness, of your wealth. And you compare that to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu masjid was what? 30 meters by 35 meters. That's it. There was no fancy chandeliers in the masjid. No fancy carpet in the masjid. 
But can you imagine the soul that came from that masjid? Can you imagine the first stuff of that masjid? Can you imagine in the first stuff you had Abu Bakr, you had Umar, you had Uthman, you had Ali, you had Abu Dhar, you had Bilal, you had Khalid, you had in the women's section, you had Fatima. You know, and all the wives of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the other pious women, radiyallahu anhum. Can you imagine? 35 meters by 35 meters. That's all it was. But the masjid had a soul. And the Messenger of Allah said to Abdullah ibn Masood radiyallahu anhu, he said, one of the signs of the day of judgment is that you will adorn your mihrabs, but your heart will be corrupted. Your mihrab, you will spend plenty of money on your mihrab, but your heart will be sick. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu said, out of the 72 signs of the day of judgment, is that people will start having pulpits which are high. The sunnah was three steps. Now you have pulpits to which will have 20 steps. These are signs. And you see, subhanallah, the amazing thing is that all these signs are within our time. You know, if somebody had said to me some of these signs about 40 years ago, you know, I won't give my exact age away, about 40 years ago, or slightly less, we would have believed it, really. We would have said impossible, no way. But within our lifespan, we have seen this come true. Many of these things within our lifespan, can you imagine the Messenger of Allah said these 1400 years ago? 1400 years ago and then they come to pass and this is why the messenger of Allah said that you will see signs that you have never seen before you will see things that you can never perceive that you never imagined one of the signs the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said hatta hatta yataqarabu zaman that a time will come that time will be close you can have, have diff two different interpretations to this one is that there will be no barakah in your time. So in a hadith, the Messenger of Allah said, a year will be like a month. A month will be like a week. A week will be like a day. A day will be like an hour. But the other interpretation, which is supported by other narrations as well, is that that journeys and those things which took you a very long time to do, you will do it within a very short time. Yet taqarabu zaman. And you look, subhanallah. I traveled from the UK 13 hours. This journey, 50 years, 100 years ago, would have taken how long? It would have taken months. Whilst we were children, if you sent a letter, it would take about a week to reach. I come from originally from Pakistan. My parents are from Pakistan. If you sent it to Pakistan, most likely you would never reach there. And if by any miracle it did reach there, it would take two, three weeks. Now you have email, instant. Yataqarabu zaman, instant. You have WhatsApp, instant. Yataqarabu zaman. Look at this, the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then in another narration he said, Tataqarabu al-aswaq, that the marketplaces will come close together. Subhanallah. He was in Mecca. Makkah didn't have huge marketplaces. Actually, marketplaces were outside, you know, the major marketplaces. He said, Tataqarabu al-Aswaq, you had your malls once upon a time. This was a sign, but now you look at it. Now the sign of the day of judgment. That you can be lying in your bed, in your pajamas, and you can buy a Mercedes Benz as long as you have one of these and a bit of money in your bank. You have the world at your fingertips. You have eBay, Amazon, the Taqarub al-Aswaq, all of it. You have it here. And the Messenger of Allah said in the same narration, he said that women will join their husbands in business. Why? Because it will be impossible. Because business will be so wide. It will be so abundant. But one of the consequences of that is that when the husband and the wife, everybody works, they have no time for the children because the dunya is their pursuit. They, they are running after the dunya. All these signs and many other signs are a sign of the day. 
And really, if you look at it, these are the signs which are bringing close the promise of shaitan. Shaitan promised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala four things. لَأُضِلَّنَّهُمْ I will lead them astray. He said, I promise you, I will lead them astray. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once sitting with a sahaba radiallahu anhum and he drew a line. He drew a line like this. And he said, this is Siratul Mustaqeem. And then he drew another line like this, outside from Siratul Mustaqeem. He said, these are lines which upon shaitan is sitting. He's waiting for man to, to take man away from the Siratul Mustaqeem. لَأُضِلَّنَّهُمْ If you look at the vast majority of humanity, the vast majority of humanity have become servants of shaitan rather than the servants of Rahman. Then the second, وَلَأُمَنِّيَنَّهُمْ I will give them unto their false passions and their desires. You look, subhanAllah, the dunya, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on another occasion, he was sitting with the sahaba radiallahu anhu, and he drew another line. So he draws a line, and then he draws a box, and then he draws lines which go out of the box. He said, you know what the first line is? The first line is man's life. And you know what the box is? The box is death. Death. And you know what these other lines are, which are outside the box? These are man's aspirations. Death befalls him, and he has all these aspirations. I want to do this. And as a poet says, Come hasaratin fi batun al maqabir. He said, If you went to the graveyard and you asked the people, What did you want to do? They would have many aspirations, but death befell them. I will give them until their false passionate desires. You will run after the dunya. You will wake for the dunya. You will sleep for the dunya. You will say Allah Akbar. You will say Allah is the greatest. But the thing which gets you out of bed is not Allah Akbar. It's not Fajr Salah. It's not Tahajjud Salah. It's work. It's college. It's university. So what is really Akbar? I will give them until their false passion and desires. This delusion. You know, you'll, you'll run after women. You'll run after men. You think that happiness lies in this. And that's exactly where shaitan wins the battle. You will run after you know, people. And, and women. And women will be your goal. And subhanallah. And this is one of the signs of the day as well. Al-Kasiyatul Ariyat, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the women, a time will come, women will be dressed, but they will be naked. You look in our time, you often pay more for clothes which are actually not there. Material. So you'll have a mini skirt which is this big, you will pay more for a mini skirt than a whole dress. Why? Because it's a fashion. So you're paying for that which is not there. And this becomes the norm. You know, Normal Finkelstein mentions, he said when the Europeans went into North America, one of the reasons that they called the North Americans, the Indian savages, the natives, were because they dressed scantily. And the European women at that time had three layers of clothes on. So they said, listen, we need to civilize these savages because they don't dress properly. Now they've decided to undress themselves. Now they look to the east and they see the Muslim women and they say, we need to civilize these people because these savages are backwards. We live in a time where you get paid to get undressed and you get fined like in France to dress. al kasiyatul ariyat which becomes a norm within your society. But it goes even worse than this. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said an amazing narration. He said, a day will come that in the middle of the street, a man and a woman will be having a relationship in broad daylight. And a man will go past. He said, people will take no, no the, the notice of these people. They will not object. And a man will go past. And he will say, only if they went to the side. 
only if they went to the side. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ذَاكَ فَذَاكَ فِيهِمْ مِثْلُ أَبِي بَكَرْ وَعُمْرْ فِيكُمْ That man amongst them will be like Abu Bakr and Umar amongst you. Subhanallah. This is a time will come. And, and, and no exaggeration. Wallahi. Messenger of Allah said, if you want to see lewdness become a norm, it's social media. You watch a YouTube clip on the side, you'll have some half naked, something lewd. And your children are sitting there. Your children have a mobile phone. Even if they don't want to inadvertently, they will be exposed. And once you are exposed, you are, cannot be unexposed to it. That is the nature. And then the third promise of shaitan is, And I will command them. And they will slit the air of the, the cattle. They will disform it. What the Arabs used to do was that they would disform, they would make a slit and they would let the animal bleed to death on the name of the idols. The, some of the Mufassirazin say that interpretation also of this is that people will disfigure the perfect creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Akbar. Subhanallah, we live in a consumer society today. They are making featherless chickens so they don't have to skin them. We have people playing God. But worse than that is when man does not like the way he's created. Allah creates you in a certain manner and you don't like your, the way you're created. Why? Because norms of beauty are set by celebrities and stars. So a time comes that you don't like the color of your skin because stars don't look like you. You don't like the way you look. And what happens? Eventually many people end up with a thing called BDD. Which is body dis uh, dysmorphic disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder is where you don't like the way you actually look. In the West they say about 2% of people suffer from this. Whilst we are actually speaking now, there will be people standing in the mirror and then these people stand for average for hours in front of the mirror and they don't like themselves. They cut their faces. Extreme examples are people beating their face with hammers. Why? Because they've shown you celebrities are of this color. They look like this. So what happens? You end up. You end up with BDD. You end up addicted to plastic surgery. Plastic surgery is actually an addiction. Like alcohol. People suffer from it. They'll have their nose done and then they're still not happy with their nose. They'll have their ears done and still not happy with their... Over 80% of people who have plastic surgery are never happy with what they've had. But we also are a cause of this illness. Why? Because we suffer from a disease called lookism. Have you ever heard of lookism? How many people ever heard of lookism? Lookism, according to many analysts, is like sexism and racism. You know, when you look at a person and you judge him by the way he looks, you come to the conclusion, ah, he's not light enough. He's not dark enough. He's not muscular enough. You know, she, her shape isn't right. Well, what are you saying? Have you ever thought about what you're saying? When you look at a person and you don't like the way that person looks or you judge them by the way that they look, what are you saying? You are taking no faults out of that person because that person did not create themselves. Allah created them. You are taking faults out of the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody creates themselves, Allah creates them. Do you have the goal and the guts to take faults out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When you look at, judge a person by the color of the skin. Who created that color? They didn't create that color. Allah created him. In the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a man called Zahir bin Haram. Zahir bin Haram was a Bedouin. He lived on the outskirts of Medina. He was a true Bedouin. His clothes were like Bedouins. You know, he never had nice clothes on. They say he, his physical features were not very beautiful either. 
He would often come to the Medina and he would sit with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes home and he asked, he said, has anybody come home today? They said, Zahir came, you were not at home and then he left. This is the greatest of creation sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He doesn't sit down, he leaves to look for Zahir bin Haram because he didn't judge him by clothes that he wore, about his features that he had. And he goes in the marketplace and Zahir had bought some stuff to sell in the marketplace. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks behind him. And he grabs Zahir bin Haram. And he said, May yashtari hadha al-abd. He said, who will buy this slave? May yashtari hadha al-abd. Who will buy this slave? And Zahir bin Haram doesn't know that this is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, let me go, let me go. And the Messenger of Allah said, May yashtari hadha al-abd. And then eventually Zahir manages to look around and he sees that it's the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he relaxes, he calms down. And he rests his head on the shoulder of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he turns around. And he said, oh Messenger of Allah, do you want to sell me? Do you really want to sell me? He said, then sell me. Because nobody will buy me because I'm Zahir bin Haram. I am of no worth in the eyes of people. And the Messenger of Allah said, Oh Zahir, you may have no worth in the eyes of people, but you are worthy in the eyes of Allah. And we, are, we need to move away from this superficial, how we view people. We view people on their looks, on the clothes that they wear, on their bank balances. Allah views a person based on their taqwa and their khayr. And this is how we need to view people. And then the final promise of shaitan. And I'm going to finish here because my time is up. I will command them and they will change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the fourth and final promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to make this very brief. But this is amazing. Initially, the mufassirun when they would do tafsir of this ayah, it would be like things like shaving your beard, plucking your eyebrows. But you look at it in our day and time. I ask you a question. Is there any greater possible of, possibility of changing the creation of Allah than a man becoming a woman or a woman becoming a man? Is there anything greater than this? Within our times, within our times, that a man has become a woman and a woman has become a man. I mean, the Messenger of Allah said 1400 years ago, a time will come, yaktafi rijal bi rijal wa nisa bi nisa. That men will suffice with men and women will suffice with women. You know, the, the concept of homosexuality did not actually even exist in the Arab Peninsula. The first time they ever came across it was when Khalid bin Walid went to Sham and he wrote a letter to Umar ibn Khattab and he said, this is what we find in this place, in Sham, not over there. And he said this 1400 years ago. And today you have what? You know, in the West they have these uh, gender neutral toilets. So don't define yourself by being a man, a woman. You know, everybody goes, you're not a man, you're not a woman. You decide what you want to be. Shaitan, I will promise them, I will command them, and they will change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wallahi, all those signs I have mentioned to you now, and there are many more, some are metaphoric, many more which have existed. All these signs I mentioned are those which have come into existence within our lifetime. Within our lifetime. Not before, not after. So, how do we react to this? See, there are two types of people when it comes to the final hour. They are that one type, they say, bro, you know what? It's going to happen. No, the Messenger of Allah said it's going to happen. So it's going to happen, so there's nothing we can do about it, so just leave it. Give it a miss. It's going to prevail. That is one type of people. And the second type of people say, no, the Messenger of Allah said it's going to happen 1400 years ago. It strengthens their iman. 
It makes them more motivated. You look at these signs of the day of judgment. 1400 years ago. You know some people guess they get one thing right. They get two things right. 1400 years ago the Messenger of Allah mentioned these things. And they have come to pass. So what does it do? It makes your iman stronger. It motivates you to do more. And you look in the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what he, what he was like. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood on the mountain of Safa. And he called the people. And he, and he was known as Sadiq al Amin amongst the people. And he said, if I was to tell you that behind this mountain there is an army ready to attack you, would you believe me? They said, of course we would believe you. You are Sadiq al Amin. And then they called them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody believed. His own uncle Abu Lahab said, Tabba laka ya Muhammad Ali, hadha jama'atana. They all left. What did the Messenger of Allah say? Look, my own people, I've worked 40 years amongst these people. They haven't accepted. Did he walk away from it? No. He carried on. He carried on. Because this is Qadrullah. What is to happen is Qadrullah. And you have to be the positive Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Evil will always be there. You have to be the khair which is out there. 21 years later, approximately, the Messenger of Allah comes back now into Makkah. The narrator says that the Messenger of Allah stands on the mountain of Safa. He says, I stand behind him. He says, by Allah, as far as my eye could see, there were people waiting to listen to the Messenger of Allah. He said, I look to my right. He said, as far as my eye could see, there were people waiting to listen to the Messenger of Allah. He said, I look to my left. As far as I could see, there were people waiting to listen to the Messenger of Allah. Within a period of 21 years, but he carried on with the dawah. And this is what believers are like. And I'm going to finish here. I know my time is up. Brothers keeps doing a shara to me. Yeah. We are the positive qadr of Allah. This strengthens our iman to do more for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do more for your community. To do more for the ummah. To make a change. You know, one thing what sometimes happens when you live in a Muslim country is that you take things for granted. Everybody or a great portion is a majority of Muslims. No, Muslims need to be achievers. They need to be people, you know, who make a change, who are the best of people. You are the, the best of people taken out for humanity. So when you see these Signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what the Messenger of Allah prophesies, then be positive. And I'm going to finish on one narration. Because I love this narration. I love it because too many of us actually fall into this. And the Messenger of Allah said this 1400 years ago. You know, nowadays when somebody wants to do something good, you see people saying, No, nah, don't bother, brother. You're wasting your time. No, don't do this. No, and they will find objections. Often those people who find the greatest objections are regarded in our community as the most pious. Why? Because they can object on everybody, but they do nothing themselves. Now, why are you doing this? You're wasting your time. Let me help the poor people. No, why are you going to help the poor people? It's their own fault. You know, you can always find a, a, a reason. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said 1400 years ago, he said, Man qala halak al-naz. Whoever says that the people have been destroyed, he is the one who has destroyed them. Why? Because he has created despondency amongst the people. They wanted to do something and he stopped them. He created despondency amongst them. And then you can also read this. Whoever says that the people have been destroyed. If you read it, means that whoever says that the people have been destroyed, he is the most destroyed from amongst them. Why? Because he doesn't trust in Allah. If he trusted Allah, he know Allah is the ultimate doer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who work for his deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who revive this great religion and this great deen again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in dunya and reunite us in Jannah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.